Um, <coughs> let me see what I got here. I got that. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm going to be speaking somewhere at this tone, this volume. Is that okay? I tried to put the camera as far back as we possibly can so I could look thinner. For all of you. Uh, it's not a joke. That's the that's truth. Okay. As soon as uh, Seth gives me the okay, I'm ready to go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the next three weeks we're going to be doing some work on uh, the male reproductive system, the female reproductive system, and contraception. Today and Thursday we're going to be talking about the male reproductive system, the organs, the functions. We're going to talk about the penis and ejaculate and prostate gland and things you might know of, but I'm going to try to give you some perspective so you can understand and make informed decisions down the road. Um, what I like to do at the beginning of each class, as you know, is to just start off with some questions, Q&A. And today it's Q&A about the male reproductive system. So even if I don't get to all the slides, even if I don't get to the purpose of this lecture, I'll make sure I weave in and out. Uh, I have some idea what I'd like to accomplish. There are three sections to the male that I would like to discuss. One is the, the lower portion, the external portion, the scrotal sac, the testicles, ejaculate, how that stuff works, how does it function, what produces what. The second, uh, I think, important area is where does it go, where does it flow, and how does it circle around and meet with other organs and secretions to form the ejaculate. And the last part of the male reproductive system that I will discuss, we'll, we'll focus on dysfunctions, issues. There'll be some, you know, uh, erectile dysfunction, impotence, prostate cancer, circumcision, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you got the, uh, the uh, uh, what we're going to do, the uh, playbook. Who wants to start us off today with a few questions? Uh, anything about the male that you'd like me to uh, start with? Yes? Um, does the concept of withdrawal really work? Does the concept of withdrawal really work? When a man pulls out of the female, coitus interruptus is what we call it. Does it work? I'm going to give you a quick answer when I talk about contraception. I'll go into more detail. Generally, uh, it is believed that you only need one sperm to fertilize an egg. That is not true. And I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically, when sperm make that journey, two, three, four hundred million sperm might be making that journey to meet up with one egg. When they get close to that egg, the egg is so large, the sperm is a microscopic. If you took a sperm cell for every human on Earth, seven billion, and you put them together, they would be about the size of Bayer aspirin. They're small. So when they get close to this egg, it takes an enormous number of sperm. What happens is the, sperm, the heads of sperm, called acrosomes, will explode, and it will release an enzyme, which you don't need to know the name. The enzyme is called hyaluronidase. And this enzyme, in mass, will help break down the ovum, the wall of an egg cell, so that one uh, sperm can enter. So the answer is, it only takes one to enter, but you literally need thousands and even possibly millions of enough of this enzyme to break down the wall. Is that? What was your question? <laughs> Withdrawal doesn't work for another reason, because guys just don't have that self-control. You know, they say, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, I'm sorry, you know. There's always a, you know, that, they don't have that great control. And with, if a man withdraws before he enters, the, uh, before he ejaculates inside the vaginal barrel, the female will not get pregnant. The problem is, it, 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 you know, over a year when you don't use any contraceptive method and you're using withdrawal, there's a pretty good chance that mistakes will happen. And as they happen, if you had one episode of sexual activity, you didn't know your partner, you didn't know your cycle, you didn't know anything about his capability, his sperm, the chances of you getting pregnant are only about 4%. One out of 25. The chances, if you continue this behavior for a year, no contraceptive, multiple partners, 
is about 80% chance that you would get pregnant. So I guess I answered that question. Did I answer that question? Uh, another question. Very good. Thank you. Come on, folks. Yes, sir. Hot tubs cook the sperm. Well, in order for sperm to produce, sperm take between 72 and 90 days to produce. It is known, it has been proven, that men who, uh, and you need about two and a half to three degrees uh, uh, cooler temperature in the scrotal sac to produce sperm. Men who are in hot tubs all the time, take jacuzzis all the time, or have tight underwear, uh, you know, they don't let their boys free at all. There's no air getting in there. That pushes the scrotal sac closer to the body, which is a 98.5 degree, 98 point whatever degree temperature. So the answer is, the f I can't say that it will cause problems, but the first treatment for people that have low sperm count is to take ice baths to try to reverse that. So there's some evidence to show that, yes, it's true, but I wouldn't say that it's conclusive because there weren't well-controlled, uh, you know, studies with, with uh, you know, groups to compare to. Did I answer your question? So, if you have an occupation where you're seated all the time, let's say you're a, a uh, truck driver, you're seated on your scrotal sac for week after week, they usually have a reduction in sperm count. Bicycle riders, I'm just saying to you, make sure that you have, uh, you give your your scrotal area, the opportunity to, I wouldn't just say relax, but get back to its normal body temperature, which is a little bit cooler than the internal temperature of your body. Thank you. Good question. How about the rest of you? Yes. Can you get pregnant following a vasectomy? Uh, yes. Uh, let me just, I'd rather try to get a, uh, let me move this around and get a picture for you. This one deserves a picture. Okay. So these are your vas deferens. These are tubes that carry sperm from the scrotal sac around to the ejaculatory duct right up here. When you have a vasectomy, the vas deferens is identified, cut, cauterized, sometimes electrical uses to prevent sperm from leaving the epididymis of the testicles and merging with the ejaculate in the ejaculatory duct. Well, what happens is, so you cut down here, but you have in the, this portion of the vas uh, deferens, and this, you see how it widens out over here? Just say yes. yes. See how it widens out? That's called the ampulla of the vas deferens. And, and they contain hundreds of millions of active sperm ready to go. So, so, so a guy goes in, has a vasectomy, uh, and then he leaves. Well, if he has sex with a partner, he has literally days worth of, depending on how often he has sex, days worth of sperm, active sperm, ready to go. So of course you can get pregnant right after a vasectomy, and men are asked to clean out. Uh, uh, you could use your imagination or whatever. They're asked to clean out and use another method of birth control prior to uh, engaging in sexual activity where you want to prevent pregnancy. You understand that? So yes, you can get pregnant. The chances are, if you wait a couple of weeks, you won't get pregnant, ladies. Two more, three more, yes. What is the most sensitive spot on You know, every guy has to, yes, the guy's this question. Uh, I, I don't want to answer it, but I'll just say, the, the most sensitive par part of the male reproductive system is the glands penis. The glands penis, I have different pictures for this. Let me see if I can go backwards. Hold on one second, okay? Okay, here we go. Uh, you see right here the head, the glands, G-L-A-N-S. Who asked me? You asked me? This is the most sensitive part of the male reproductive system. Around it, under it, and the foreskin often covers that area and can reduce sensitivity. The base of the penis is also sensitive, and the underside of the scrotal sac has many nerve endings. But nothing is close to the top, the coronal ridge, the glands. That's the answer. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean things don't feel good in other parts of the body. There's nerve endings in the nipple region. There's nerve endings everywhere. So uh, does that answer your question? Okay, two more, and we'll be done. Yes. 
pre-ejaculatory fluid. Um, there's a, an organ called Cowper's gland, bulbourethral gland, which secretes a substance right before a man ejaculates to actually neutralize the acid in the urethra, which we urinate from, so sperm are not killed off. Uh, it is found in about 25% of all sperm cell, uh, when they look at ejaculates, 25% of pre-ejaculatory fluids contain sperm cell, but they contain thousands of sperm, not two, four, five hundred million. So the chances of getting, uh, you know, you, since you were taught this already, I'll say I wouldn't take chances on, on uh, pre-ejaculatory fluid, because there's only a, a microsecond before pre-ejaculatory fluid and the ejaculate comes out. So it's a very short period of time. So I would say no if it was just pre-ejaculatory fluid. If you want to know if it was pre-ejaculatory fluid or not, you can tell by what's going on in the male. If, if a man is excited and he's ready to come, uh, the pre-ejaculatory fluid is when the phone rings, he's able to answer it and not ejaculate. That's, if anything, that's at the tip of the penis, a fluid, it's pre-ejaculatory fluid. Once the ejaculate starts, there are 0.6 seconds apart, and there's about six contractions. Once it starts, it must take its course, so there's, you know, the chances are that if, if someone walked in on you, your mother walked in you, and blah, 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 there's nothing you could do. And I would say no, there's really no chance, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, bet my last dollar on it either because of the small space between the pre and the regular ejaculate, okay? Get more into it on contraception. There's a hand back there. One last question. Doing great. That's it? No more questions? Mm -hmm. Why isn't there a male pill? Why isn't there a male pill? Well, since 1964, they've had the ability to have a male pill, and there's three or four different mechanisms that can be used to prevent sperm from uh, being uh, ejaculated outside the male. Pharmaceutical companies know that it won't work. People won't buy it. Uh, if, if the female pill, in reality, is only about 85 to 90 percent effective, can you imagine how ineffective a male pill will be? You know, if a, if a partner said to you, did you take your pill today? Sure I did. The, the guys won't, you know, say no. And what I'm saying to you is, it's an economic issue. Because they have had pills other parts of the world. Makes sense. But, you know, that's why. Pharmaceutical companies are there to make money. And... Uh, Again, we'll get to that next time. So let's talk about the male reproductive system. At any time, raise your hand if you have any questions about anything. I want you to be able to make more informed decisions about what's going on there. You know, a, a lot of people ask about the ejaculate. There's a lot of questions about that. I have a series of questions that another class wrote out. And why does it smell a certain way? And, and, and why does it look differently all the time? And, Things like that. Why do guys, why don't they have good aim when they have an erection going to urinate? These are questions I want to answer. I want you to, to be informed. I want you to be able to make decisions. I want you to understand things, not just be able to take a test. All right? So, uh, by the way, the reason that it changes in its, in its color and smell is the amount of uh, uh, seminifer excuse me, seminal vesicle fluid that you have. The seminal vesicle fluids provide the nutrients and help with the movement of sperm cells. And that's what gives it its, whether it's a watery-like material or whether it's a glue-like or, or more uh, 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 a together substance. Uh, the prostate gland gives it its color and odor. And each time a man ejaculates in a short period of time, you have less and less semin uh, excuse me, seminal vesicle fluid. So sometimes it's very thick and that if a man ejaculates frequently in a short period of time, it'll become more water-like. But don't be fooled by that. You can still get pregnant. The number of sperm cells that are there really don't change that much. It's just other substances are reduced. Okay? Yes? So it doesn't really depend on like, what they eat or... No, food will affect, your diet will affect the color and odor. Vegetarians have a, a less pungent odor than meat eaters. But um, I didn't have this uh, 
scientific uh, study in my laboratory. I just want you to know what I read and what I know. Yes, diet does affect it, and health and fitness affects it. How long a man took before he ejaculated last doesn't really affect that. It affects other things. Okay? So let's get started here. Let me get back a little bit. Uh, so we're going to start off with the uh, external genitalia. External in the male, meaning they're away from the body. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, the functions of the testicles and the scrotal sac. The testicles will secrete testosterone, which help develop uh, male sex uh, characteristics. They help development with the development and the release of sperm. And basically, there's, uh, there aren't that many functions. Basically, to produce uh, sperm cells and help them being propelled to the ejaculate. Uh, this is a cross-section. This is how the male reproductive system actually looks. The penis, the scrotal sac, you can see the anal region. It's complicated when you look at it this way. So I'm using this particular slide to help you. This is a frontal look. The, the male reproductive system really doesn't look this way, but it's easier to teach. Do, do you understand that? I'm just trying to not give you a cross-sectional view. Uh, the scrotal sac, on, you have two scrotum. The scrotal sac has two main functions. One function is to protect the testicles inside. The second function is it has a spermatic cord attached to it, which help move the testicles back and forth so that when a man has an erection, the testicles will get closer to the body and these cremastric muscles will actually contract and relax accordingly. Why is this important? Well, um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the, the scrotal sac. They, they have different looks. Sometimes they look like a puny old man. They're all shriveled up. And sometimes they're flat and smooth. Well, that's basically when a man has an erection, it will become more smooth. When a man is at rest, when he doesn't have, when he detumescence, occurs when it's just flaccid the penis, it will be more shrivelly. That's so you have enough tissue there, this chromastric muscle, so when you need to expand it when a man has an erection, you can. And that's really called the spermatic cord. Again, I will get to that. So you only have two main functions, to help regulate temperature of the testicles and also to protect the testicles. Okay? Many things will affect sperm count. And, the, and even though you have the scrotum intact, in the gentleman back there mentioned one. Uh, occupation affects sperm count. Altitude affects sperm count. The higher up you go, generally the less your sperm count will be. Radiation will affect your sperm count, being exposed to radiation. I wouldn't worry about the microwave. I'm talking about radiation. Stress will affect your sperm count. Many things, and of course, hot Baths, tubs, tight underwear will affect your sperm count. All right? And there's a few others, but those are the main ones. Yes, sir? I'm sure drugs can affect your sperm count, but I'll tell you something. Uh, drugs usually affect other things more profoundly. Uh, uh, years ago, there were many studies that looked at marijuana. Does that affect your sperm count? And they found some changes uh, in sperm count, reduced numbers, et cetera, et cetera. They found testosterone levels reduced. But, you know, they don't have that many controlled studies for me to say with certainty. I just know that drugs will affect everything. Now, uh, uh, it depends when drugs are taken as well. See, when they're taken in the mother while you're developing, that's one thing. When they're taken during puberty, that's another. And when they're taken when you're an adult, that's a third. Uh, of course, the first two are much more dangerous regarding your overall sensitivity and productivity of the sperm. Okay? Uh, here's just something interesting. You, you, you mentioned something. You know, at birth, well, I, excuse me, in utero, forget at birth, in utero, when we're developing around six, seven weeks of development, we all start out as females. Our reproductive systems are all females. And there's a series of ducts that develop called Wolfian and Mullerian ducts. The Wolfian ducts transform this tissue from female to male, and the Mullerian ducts to female. So I just like to tell all the guys that, you know, at one point you, you were a girl. And, you know, 
Uh, we all have similar hormones, but uh, it's just interesting that, you know, the, the uh, clitoris and the penis come from the same tissue. The scrotal sac and the labia come from the same tissue. Again, I will go over that another day, but uh, it's, it's amazing. All it is is a series of ducts and hormonal changes that make us make our reproductive systems different. Where were we? The, uh, we were talking about the scrotal sac. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm going to just, I'll come back to this. I just want you to know that sperm take around, uh, let's say, uh, a few months to develop, 72 to 90 days. They develop in the seminiferous tubules. You're going to need to know these terms, but they're in your book. I'm going to go over them. I'll, I'll, we'll have review sessions. The seminiferous tubules is like a mile worth of network in a very small, uh, it's about the size of an almond, the testicles, the testes. Very small amount of space. So obviously when you have a mile worth of network in a very small space, you have a lot of nerve endings in there. So when a guy gets hit down below and it hurts quite a bit, it's, it has a lot to do with the amount of space that's in the scrotal sac itself. There's very little room in there. Uh, in the middle, right in the middle of these, uh, of these, it's not shown on this slide, is something called the rete testes. I want you to write this down, rete testes, R-E-T-E, testes. The rete testes, it, it acts like a cork-like structure which, which takes all the sperm that are being developed in the seminiferous tubules and filters out defective sperm. It's kind of neat. And then the rete testes connects directly. You see this outer area here called the epididymis? Can you see that? Say yes. You can see it over here. This is the inside of it. Yes? yes. Who said no? OK. The epididymis houses mature sperm. The epididymis, it's when you're, you're these are the ones that are going to be passed on to the vast deferens that we mentioned, and it's going to be carried along this pathway where it opens up, called the ampulla, and meets with other substances to form the ejaculate. Okay? So inside the testes, you have the seminiferous tubules where, where sperm develop and mature. You have the rete testes, a cork-like structure to help uh, filter out defective sperm. And then you have the epididymis, just on the outer layer, which help uh, house mature sperm and then transport it through the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct. Any questions? Okay. So it's a fairly elaborate process on how this thing works. You know, people say, well, is that it? You know, it takes so long to, to produce sperm? Yes. When a man does not uh, utilize the sperm, they're absorbed by the body, and new sperm are developed. Because everyone always thinks, well, a man hasn't ejaculated in such a long period of time. Are they rotten sperm? You hear, sperm, you hear all these wild things. No, they're not. And, and, you know, guys use this whole craziness about ejaculation. You know, they say, if I don't come, my head's going to blow off, you know. I'm going to die, I'm going to faint. And they use that as a vehicle for sexual favors. And ladies, you know that it's total bullshit, you know, that whole idea. Uh, and if it's true that their head will explode, you know, get your camera out and, and tape it. Put it on YouTube if, if that's the case. I don't think it is. Any questions about sperm development? Okay. Uh, back to the penis. I, I want you to know, you know, there's questions about size of the penis. And uh, let me uh, see if I have a slide on that. This is the inside of the, uh, what the penis looks like. You have a series of three uh, cylinders that are sponge-like material that engorge with blood, the corpus cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum. You see them in here? They're just sponges. There's no muscles in there. You can't develop it. You know, people say, can I, can I work it? No, the penis is all soft tissue and, and sponge-like material so that it engorges with blood and stands erect. Uh, they can, men can do Kegel exercises or Kegel exercises like women to actually uh, 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 work their organ better, but it's not a muscle. It's not like the heart. It's not like the biceps. Okay? Uh, 
Those are your chambers. They fill with blood. Penis becomes erect. And when, this is interesting, when the penis stands erect, it says here, it blocks urine. This is an important point, and I want to go back to this. Unfortunately, come on. Okay, this I need your imagination a little bit, because I don't have a name for this. I've looked, they, you know, anatomy and physiology books, they don't have a name for this. See right over here, right over here is the ejaculatory duct. You see this area here right above the prostate gland? This is where the ampulla meets of the vas deferens. This is where the seminal vesicles secrete secretion and the prostate gland all meet together. Right above, right here in this area up here, there's an actual doorway. It's a doorway. And this doorway is always uh, open, okay, so that urine can come down from the bladder and leave the penis through the urinary meatus. The urinary meatus is the opening, the hole, to the penis. In this, it's the same thing in the female, okay? So there's this doorway up here. And when a man gets an erection, what happens is as the penis stands erect, it closes a doorway so that it's always open, and when an erection occurs, it actually is physically attached so that this doorway closes so a man cannot ejaculate and have urine come out at the same time. You know, why can't a man? Well, people are always w wondering, well, that's the answer. Now, sometimes when men have surgical procedures like certain prostate gland, uh, let's just say prost enlarged prostate, sometimes cancer of the prostate, they have surgeries that can actually affect this doorway and, uh, and damage this doorway. And what happens when the doorway is damaged, uh, sometimes sperm, as they come around, get diverted into the bladder. Instead of coming down naturally, they get diverted into the bladder. And this is called retrograde ejaculation. Retrograde ejaculation. When sperm get diverted into the bladder because this doorway has been damaged. See, what happens with prostate cancer uh, uh, at times is sometimes they don't go in and just operate. Sometimes they go through the urethra and they drill the area that might be growing, causing a man to have problems with his urination. So when they're going in with that drill, it's pretty close to this doorway, and that's one of the ways that it gets defective. Just to mention, it is not true that men who go through prostatic procedures whatever procedure, will definitely be impotent or not have the ability to get an erection. That is not true. It is common, but it is not a fact, and we'll, come to, we'll talk about that in, on another day. So any questions so far about anything? Okay, so sperm is stored in the epididymis, right? Uh, mature sperm are stored in the epididymis, so, as well as the vas deferens as well as the ampulla of the vas deferens. How much sperm is like, stored in there? Because isn't it like after you ejaculate, the next time you ejaculate is like No. If you're going to ask me, is it less? Yeah. You're going to ask me if it's less? If a ma the average ejaculate is about three milliliters. Let's just throw out a, a, an amount. It's like a teaspoon, all right? The number of sperm in each ejaculate does not it doesn't get reduced unless a man breaks all types of world records, you know, understand, in a short period of time. What is reduced is the seminal vesicle fluid, prostatic secretion, which I'll get to. So that a man might ejaculate three or four times in a short period of time and might have two, three, four, five, six hundred million sperm ejaculate, ejaculated each time, okay? Now, even if it's reduced, we're talking about, you know, instead of 300, 280 million, okay? Plenty. And there's this myth that, well, I'll use that as a birth control method, and I don't mean by you, by many women, you know, second, third time, I'm not going to get pregnant. Oh, yes, you will. We have one million unintended and unwanted pregnancies each year. These are some of the reasons why. The, the number of sperm cells is not reduced. The, number, the amount of other secretions is. Does that answer your question? And I, 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 I want to be emphatic about that. I don't want to... You know, because people say, oh, now it's okay, you know, second or third time. I don't know how, you know, uh, what are the records? You know, you're, you're in college. I've heard guys being able to ejaculate 15 times in one night. You know, I, I would think they die. But uh, 
what, do you, what have you heard? Come on, let me hear some numbers. All of a sudden, you're not talking because we're taping today. I get it. What was that? Yeah, like with every meal, you know, I'm done. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. But three times a day sounds, sounds okay. But I'm talking about like in one episode, you hear stories of someone being able to ejaculate 15 times in one night. Have you ever heard things like this? By number two, they're sleeping. I don't understand that, you know. But some of the myths and fallacies need to come out. There are freaks everywhere, right? So I don't want to say, oh, that's impossible to anything. But generally, men don't ejaculate five, six times in a short period of time. When guys are younger, they're able to maintain their erection better. Their resolution phase of the sexual response <coughs> is shorter, meaning the time they need to recoup. Physiologically, men need some time to recoup to have a resolution phase after they ejaculate. ejaculate. Women don't have that problem. They have no resolution phase. So they can, they can have the capability of going from an orgasm to an orgasm. Men don't have that ability. The idea that multiple orgasm is out there for females is not a good thing because one out of every three females can't even achieve an orgasm. So the idea that some women are like hanging on chandeliers for the 20th time, you understand? It's not a good uh, idea to have that out there. Uh, people can be satisfied without achieving orgasm. They could enjoy it. It could be fun and sensitive. Uh, much too much is made of that particular end product. What were we talking about? How'd we get here? All right, I'll throw, I'll throw a question out for you. Um, since not all women can achieve an orgasm, which behaviors are the most predictive of a female achieving orgasm? The other day we talked about sexual normality. We put all these weird words on the board. By the way, I left it on the board, and the faculty member that came in last class was freaking out. And she was pretty short. She couldn't uh, get up that high, and I had to come running back and erase everything. All your stuff. <laughs> all your stuff. Uh, so what did I just ask you? Which behavior is the most predictive of a female achieving an orgasm? What do you think? Uh, what behaviors? Intercourse, uh, oral sex. Oral sex. You're pretty sure about that. <laughs> masturbation. Anyone else? It's, it's masturbation first, oral sex second, and intercourse third. Guys are so, you know, it's me, it's this. They spend so much time thinking that I'm the one, you know. No, you haven't been with anyone unless you've been with me, you know. And, and of course, you know, uh, once you've gone this way, you don't go back. I won't put in all the uh, different things. That are, but the truth is that it's probably the least, product, uh, least predictive behavior for females to achieve orgasm. Yet we don't talk about masturbation and oral sex in our society. We just, it's kind of like out there, but it's not really up front. Intercourse is finally, you know, I could say intercourse, made love, screwed, and all the other terms you put on the board the other day. So I just wanted you to know that uh, if you really want to understand the female capability, you need to at least uh, think about all the behaviors that can help her achieve. I'm not telling you what to do, how to act, how to behave. I think you need the facts in front of you. Okay. Other questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, retrograde ejaculation is, here's the prostate gland, okay? You got that? Could you see that? Well, what happens is when the prostate gland gets enlarged, it puts pressure on the urethra, which goes from here all the way to the bladder, where you urinate from. So as this narrows and puts pressure on it, sometimes it's due to precancerous conditions, sometimes it's just infection, they go in and do procedures. And when they go in and do procedures, whether they cut the prostate gland, whether they drill through this area, it often causes this doorway right over here to be damaged. And this doorway is essential to block urine from coming down. So as sperm come around this area to the ampulla, it's going to mix with the other ejaculate. Because this doorway is damaged, it can be diverted, instead of coming down this way, into the bladder. And once it enters the bladder, 
you're going to have a urinary tract infection. And one thing you, you have to know for sure, since sperm are so small, they're microscopic, they're so tiny, number one, you wouldn't know that uh, it wasn't in the ejaculate. A man would still ejaculate, you wouldn't know it. But the urinary tract infection is the kind of a, one of the things they'll look at, whether it was damaged. And because sperm in the, urine, in the urine itself, there's going to be all types of fights going on. What is this stuff? And you're going to build up some autoantibodies. When you build up autoantibodies, they kind of kill off sperm. So guys that have this problem in the future sometimes don't have quality sperm counts because their bodies manufacture these autoantibodies. Did I answer your question? Okay, any others? Okay, so let's take this a little further. <clears throat> it's about 22. We might be able to make some more progress. Okay, we have the seminiferous tubules. We have the epididymis, the vas deferens. Okay? Now, let's talk about the, what happens at the ejaculatory duct. I just want you to be able to see. It's in this area right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these together. What, or, what are the three secretions that form the ejaculate. Does anyone want to take a shot? Come on, you read about it. You could see it. Don't want to take a shot? Okay, number one, you have sperm from the, sperm from the ampulla, right? Sperm from the, the vas deferens. The second thing is the prostate gland secretes a substance and the third is right above it, you have these seminal vesicles. Let's talk about uh, the seminal vesicles first. So you have sperm, obviously, from the ampoule of the vas deferens. It mixes with the seminal vesicle secretion, right here. The seminal vesicles uh, basically make up between 46 and 80 percent of the ejaculate. So when you have less ejaculate, it's due to less seminal vesicle secretion. The seminal vesicles have two functions. One function is it gives the sperm uh, the glue-like glue substance when it comes out. And I'm going to ask you, let me, let me uh, do a very thin sperm here. If you had a sperm cell, okay, and this is the acrosome. This is the head of the sperm. Anyway, can, can anybody see that little thing? I just want you to see the tail. What happens is the tails are always moving in sperm. They're always moving. They're just going like this. The top part of the sperm, the acrosome, only is going to provide you DNA and, and hyaluronidase, that enzyme. But because it's going like this, we need something to keep them under control. And the seminal vesicle secretion up here provides this glue-like substance which grabs onto the tails and keeps them from moving. So you have two, three, four hundred million sperm that are just being held together by the seminal vesicle secretion. You got it? When they finally enter the vaginal barrel, um, the pH, the acid-base nature of the vaginal barrel, is slightly acidic. It's about 3.5 pH. Well, what does that? It's not acid like you put your hand in there, you're going to lose your hand, need a hook, N none of that. But I want you to know that as this pH starts to, it will start dissipating the seminal vesicle secretion so that it goes from this to a little bit less tight and all of a sudden there's no more seminal vesicle and the sperm start moving again. So they're always moving, the seminal vesicles provide the substance that keeps them from moving and then when it's dissipated inside the vaginal barrel they start moving again. Once they start moving they start swimming. And we know all about the movies you've seen. You know, they swim up current and all that other jazz. The second function of the seminal vesicles, it provides fructose, sugars, in case uh, the sperm needs some nutrients along the way. It has a nutrient value. So it, it provides, it, it affects mo motility of sperm or movement of sperm, as well as provides nutrients for sperm. So when you combine that, you have sperm, Combined with seminal vesicle secretion, you have nutrients and you have the ability to hold sperm in place. Now you have two. And the last part of the ejaculate is prostatic secretion. The prostate gland, like a walnut, sits right around the urethra. It secretes a substance that, that uh, uh, is emptied into the ejaculate. <clears throat> 
This substance is responsible for neutralizing the acid in the vaginal area. So that in case it makes the journey, when it gets to the vaginal area, you have something that's going to neutralize this 3.5 pH so that sperm live, they can survive. So the three contents together, the ampulla of the vest deferens provides sperm, the seminal vesicles provide nutrients, and they also help with sperm motility or movement, and the prostatic secretion help neutralize the substance so they're not killed off in the vaginal barrel. Those are the three contents of the ejaculate. The ampulla, the seminal vesicles, and the prostate gland. Now right below this, you have these little bulb-like structures. You see this? They're called Cowper's gland. Just say yes if you could see it. Okay. Another name for Cowper's gland is bulbiurethral gland. Yes, I want you to know that because I never am sure what I ask on your exams. Cowper's gland lies right below the prostate gland. And these are the two bulb-like structures that secrete a substance which helps neutralize the acid in the urethra. So before ejaculate comes out of the, uh, down the urethra, out of the penis, the bulbiurethral gland secretes a pre-ejaculatory fluid to help neutralize the acid in the urethra. That's your pre-ejaculatory fluid. And in about a quarter of these uh, substances, sperm are found. It's really not meant to uh, 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 cause pregnancy in females, but sperm can be found in there. But the bulbourethral gland has nothing to do with the ejaculate. It's just secreted before, so the lining of the urethra, this lining, is, is uh, less acetic so that uric acid doesn't kill off the sperm. It's a kind of complete system. You have something that's going to line the, the uh, penis itself, the urethra, so that sperm aren't killed. You have uh, the sperm entering with a substance that affects its motility and gives it nutrients, the seminal vesicles. And that combines with the prostatic secretion in case it makes the journey all the way. If it makes the journey, then you have uh, uh, the acid level in the vaginal barrel not affecting the sperm itself. So it can make its journey through the vaginal barrel way up into the uterus and possibly even into the fallopian tube where it can meet with, you know, an egg cell. It's a pretty tough journey. It's possible. I saw a hand over there. Okay. Questions? You got it? Silence, a lot of silence. So what did you learn so far? Tell me something you learned so far. I learned that. Let me hear some things. The three stages? I didn't talk about stages of ejaculation. I could. Yeah, what, what are the three uh, substances that are found in ejaculate? What are they? Sperm from the ampulla. Seminal vesicle secretion and? Very nice. Thank you. Very good. What else did you learn? Don't look down. I'm not going to call you. What did you learn? Hmm? Um, that warm temperatures and like, tight underwear can affect sperm count. Warm temperatures will affect sperm count, but to what degree, we're not sure. Uh, it's very important that you not continue to take the, the hot baths and the hot tubs and the jacuzzis all the time. Correct. What else? Yeah, they don't just happen overnight. It takes a, a couple of months to develop. It's a, a never-ending process. Two more. What'd you learn? <laughs> Withdrawal doesn't work. That's correct, and I'm glad you learned that. And one last one? Okay, thank you. So let me uh, go on and talk a little bit about circumcision, all right? Around the penis, you have this foreskin, this tissue that uh, we're all born with, all males are born with. And this foreskin, uh, prepuce, there's many terms at what it's called, uh, are very often cut so that, well, first of all, if, if it's not cut, you're going to have a sheath of 
uh, tissue always covering the glands penis. So if it's pulled back, it's the same structure as the penis always was. It doesn't really affect much, but in tradition, especially in Jewish tradition and Muslim tradition, this was cut and, and uh, it was called in Judaism a bris and other religions it's done as well, to cut the foreskin. A couple of things about this. Number one, they say it doesn't hurt. I don't know. Babies cry, scream, turn blue. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're you know, a few days old very often. Uh, I do know that it heals very quickly. And there's not much to the surgery as far as healing. There aren't many problems with that. But the big issue was, is it hygienic to be circumcised? Not just tradition. And for about 40 to 50 years, there's been research to try to say men need to be circumcised because their partners are more likely to have infections, higher rates of cancers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The jury's out on that. I could tell you that there's not much evidence to say that men need to be circumcised for that reason. But underneath this foreskin, underneath here, what happens if a man does not clean it properly uh, waxy substances can build up underneath it, and these waxy substances have bad odor. They carry a lot of bacteria. Uh, this substance is called smegma, S-M-E-G-M-A. A great word, a great term, because it doesn't sound good, does it? Smegma. How's your smegma doing today, you know? If men clean, if men are hygienic, and they are not circumcised, there really is no problem. There isn't any problem with uh, hygiene. So if men bathe regularly, you know, do they need to be circumcised? That's up to the parent, because the kid doesn't have much say in it at a few days old. Uh, but it will develop fast if you have the foreskin in place. And uh, it, the, when the foreskin is, stays on, when a man is not circumcised, very often... Uh, they have a reduced sensitivity in the glands penis, you know, the most sensitive part of the penis. So that sexual activity can be, uh, they, they're not as excited. And this is great for premature ejaculators, guys that are very excited. Too bad we can't reattach some of those foreskin to help them hold off longer. So it's not necessarily true that it, uh, it needs to be done for hygienic reasons. Over 98% of all males are circumcised today in this country. You need parental, uh, 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 at least an OK, to, to be able to do this. Permission. You know, in Judaism, it's just funny. It's, it's always amazing. It's, it's pretty heavy. It's, it's really interesting to watch as, a, as the penis, the foreskin is cut off. And I can't believe that everyone is always so hungry. They usually have food after this. You know, everyone's running for the food. Well, if you've ever seen it done, you know, you lose your appetite at least for five minutes, you know. Any questions about circumcision? How did this start? Well, nomadic Jewish tribes have been doing it for uh, almost 5,000 years, but it's not that long. Uh, and Muslim uh, groups as well. So it's been going on for thousands of years. So if you're asking how, does it, how did it start? Well, it starts like anything else, whether it's doctors, witch doctors, whoever is in that community who's in charge of the health and well-being, realize that there's this substance that's building up here. Maybe uh, you don't need that. You know, I, I don't know is what I'm telling you. I have no idea. As one of your fact sheet projects, that would be a great topic while you're selecting topics. How did this thing start? You know, it's like, you know, how does the IUD start? People ask me. Well, I could tell you that I could go back to uh, 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 times where they didn't want camels to get pregnant in the desert, so they, they put these large boulders inside the uterus, uteri, of camels to prevent pregnancy. They didn't even know how it worked. And that carried on for thousands of years until uh, 1920s, as Dr. Graffenberg said, hey, if we put a silver ring inside the uterus of females, they won't get pregnant. And you had the first IUD. You know, the history of how things occur is interesting, but certainly not my specialty, you know? So I don't know, but I could just tell you that it's been around for thousands of years. And in the 1950s, the uh, rate of circumcision was much, much uh, lower than it is today. 
So from the 60s through the 90s, it just took off as a practice. It's almost, it's almost common practice today. Is there a hand over there? Okay. Blue balls. People ask me about that all the time. What is it? Help me out. Couple of a couple of questions. What is blue balls? Another question is, men, can you control when you get an erection? That's the second question. Uh, we'll leave it at, at those two for now. Um, it is believed that when you build up a lot of sexual tension, all your organs are engorged with blood, your body is ready to achieve an orgasm, and you're cut off. <clears throat> Except we know that sometimes guys out of nowhere could be just seated in a geometry class, and boom, it hits. Okay? So we know that uh, part of that is myth. I don't disagree with it because that's the common belief that if you don't relieve sexual tension, uh, it, you know, it, it will affect, it'll be severe pain down there. I guess the black and blue, the blue balls came from a color, all right? Any other guys want to take a shot or girls? What about erections? When do guys get erections? Absolutely correct. It just happens during the day. Uh, at birth, probably until you get to be very old. I was going to say until death. But uh, I, you know, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are some people that die and it uh, die. Some older men die and it, it takes a few weeks to close the coffin. But uh, generally, uh, a man never knows when he's going to get an erection. And women always have this idea that it's almost planned, you know, that... It's planned. The guy doesn't have any control. I mean, again, you could be in class, you get an erection. You could have some sexual thoughts, of course, get an erection. You could be in the ocean. It could be lightning out. And all of a sudden, you get an erection. And they blow the whistle, everybody out of the water. You know, no, I'll stay a little while, you know. I'm going to hang out in here because, uh, because you have an erection. And it's not like, you know, uh, uh, something that you can control. I will say that almost always when a man is sexually excited, he will achieve an erection. I can say that. But as far as a man getting an erection, it occurs from birth all the way through their life at any time, as well as a female lubricating and her vaginal area lubricating. It occurs all the time from birth. At birth, you don't have any sexual ideas. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. Right? I know you do, but, you know, maybe you do. We don't know because kids don't speak. They don't communicate until really, and don't, uh, their, their cognitive capability really doesn't occur until about age two and a half to three. Any questions, erections, blue balls? Yes. Why do guys always get morning A morning what? Morning. Oh, an erection? Yeah. Because the whole night, maybe ten different times he's had an erection. And the, when, bladder, when your bladder fills up with urine, it's going to put pressure where you don't get rid of the erection as fast. When your man is flaccid and he goes to the bathroom, it'll stay flaccid. When a man has a full bladder, uh, that erection will usually be, be there. And that is why, by the way, let me, uh, let me just uh, say this. Uh, very often a guy will wake up in the middle of the night, he'll have a semi-erect penis or an erect penis, and he'll try to urinate. Remember that doorway that we talked about? Hello. Well, that doorway is basically, when you have an erection, it's basically closed. So urine comes out of that. So it's like a nozzle on a, on a gardening tool, right? When you have that nozzle, when it's very small, that opening, it sprays out all over. And that's why a guy needs to wait a few seconds for his erection to, to subside so that that doorway opens so that he has one nice flowing area. Sometimes a guy will tell you, and, and it's kind of weird, they got three streams. They don't know where this thing's going to go. It's like out of control, and that's due to the doorway, the opening. But usually it's due to pressure from the bladder on that particular region. It's a great question, and that's the answer. I'm sticking to it. Anything else? Yes, sir. I told you that it's, well, I'll stick with it's usually due to 
sexual tension that's built up needs to be released. Okay? That's a standard answer, but we don't know. I'll say that uh, I'd rather stick with we don't know than that answer. That's what the book will say. That's what experts will say. We don't know. We just don't know. I can tell you it's the only organ in the body, in the scrotal area, where if, if you hit a guy, if you hit him in the head, he'll go like that. If you hit him in the arm, he'll go like that. If you hit him down here, he won't grab it. He'll go back to the head. Guys know early on that it's very sensitive, it hurts, and you could hit them all you want. They're not going to grab that. It hurts. Remember, you have a mile worth of network in a very small area. Okay. What else? All right, let me uh, just go over a few more. And uh, I mentioned this before. Let's talk about the size of the penis. All right. I don't know how to say this without insulting people, but I want to say first, to say that the size of a penis doesn't matter is a lie. It's like any other body part that turns you on or turns you off, ladies, guys, whatever. So I don't want to de-emphasize that, but I want you to know that the average size of a penis, when flaccid, when not erect, can be about two to three inches up to six or seven inches. Of course, we know people that are flaccid even larger, but let's not go there. That's generally the continuum. And it says, the growers and the showers. What's interesting is, the short, when you have a smaller penis at rest, when it's flaccid, it will gain more size during your er erection. So a three-inch penis might go to a six-inch penis, 100% increase, while a six-inch penis might go to an eight-inch penis, it'll only increase 25%. It's something, you know, maybe you believe in God, but it's kind of weird that, you know, everything seems to kind of balance out when a man becomes erect. But to think that, that it doesn't matter at all is foolish. It's not uh, wise to think that way, all right? Now, let's just get this thing out about black men, you know? We, we got to talk about it. Everyone wants to know. Are, are black men more endowed? The research is quite clear that, let's use Caucasians for a second. If a man is five foot tall, uh, his penis probably be, will be smaller than a man, a Caucasian male, who's seven feet tall. Generally, there is some correlation to height and size. Not always, as every guy will tell you. I, saw, you know, I know a guy, you know, five foot three, you know, it's hanging down to the floor. They'll tell you all types of stories. So I don't want you to think that way, but we're talking generally. So if generally someone's taller, bigger, chances are their penis will also be bigger. There's all types of devices now. Um, I'm going to say this, even though it's on tape. You know, kids are, you, you people are very cruel. So um, I would get things put on my door, like doc, uh, over Dr. Siegel, it'll be an ad for penis enlargement. You know, just, just, just because you're stupid, that's why, you know. And, you know, all these ads. Well, <clears throat> there are some operations where, number one, they, uh, they cut the ligaments that hold the penis in place. And by doing that, it will elongate approximately one inch. And it ain't worse, it's not worth the surgery. And sometimes they, people have uh, not implants, but uh, uh, they implant adipose tissue fat into that area. And it can make it thicker, but it also could be clumpy, bumpy, and looks real weird, and it's really dangerous. So all these devices, and what it, it is what it is, uh, and a man needs to be partially erect in order to enter the vaginal barrel. He doesn't need a full erection. We all know, well, this is kind of important, I, I, whether you know it or not, I'm going to say it. <clears throat> the outer one-third of the vaginal barrel in the female, where the external genitalia is, the labia, the opening to the vagina, is very, very, very sensitive. The inner two-thirds of the vaginal barrel have very few nerve endings. So that if it's the size of the penis that really is exciting to you, well, you can't feel it. Although some people say, I could feel you deep inside of me. They're only feeling the outer one-third. So I want you to know that during the sex act or intercourse itself, it's not the size. We, we, you know, it's a, what are some of the sayings? It's not the size of the wave, but the motion of the ocean. What are some of the others? It's what you do with it. Come on. 
You don't have any? You never heard of these? Well, if you haven't heard of these, it's what you do with it that counts. And size, does it matter? Well, I think it matters. I just think it's a preoccupation we have. Every joke is about size of penis. Every, it's it's kind of weird, you know? It's just weird. Anything else? Okay. Now, this is just a close-up of the seminiferous tubules inside the testicles and what I showed you before about the epididymis. So what I want to do next class is I want to take you through uh, the sequence again. You know, what, what is this? The sequence starts at the testicles, works its way around the ejaculatory duct where the seminal vesicles, the ampoule, and the prostate come together. But I want to talk a little bit more about dysfunctions and, and what is impotence and what is premature ejaculation and things related to the male reproductive system. So how did we do today? Good? You sure? Have a nice class. I'll see you uh, this Thursday. Have a good day. One second.